Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds. Tonight, a requested program. I happened to mention this topic uh, on a live uh, last week, and the response was people wanted me to talk more in depth about it. So we are going to be talking about the decline in northern bobwhites and other ground nesting birds and what all is involved with that. And my background experience with this is, you know, having grown up in southeastern North Carolina, uh, like many of you, Bob White's the familiar was one of the most common bird songs I, I learned when I was young. They were they were very common in southeastern North Carolina. And I understand they, uh, you know, across much of their range, which is primarily the southern U.S., but it, up into the north and some of the uh, northern states have them fringing into it, and, uh, but not super far west. Uh, but in that area, the Bob Whites have uh, declined dramatically over the last, especially 50 to 60 years. And so have many of the ground nesting birds or the grassland suite of birds. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the 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 grasslands and what has happened and what has caused the demise of one of uh, definitely one of America's favorite game birds, the northern bobwhite, but also uh, you can tie it into a lot of the other grassland birds. So as you can imagine, have been, as a wildlife biologist working on Fort Bragg, Fort Liberty, Fort Bragg again, now I understand, um, and I was responsible for monitoring the bobwhite population. I was responsible for collecting the data from uh, hunters when they brought uh, their birds in uh, and and analyze uh, patch dates, all that kind of thing, you know, that, that a biologist does. Well, obviously, I got to speak with a lot of hunters, and I got a lot of opinions as to what was happening to the uh, the quail population. And what well, you can guess, number one, which was always a blame. Anyone? Anyone? All right, here we go. We're going to start. The northern bobwhite, a wonderful, wonderful bird. Everybody knows this is the male with its beautiful white, you know, white throat and eye stripe. The female has tan, and we'll get back to him it, 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 all through the program. So, the it, when hunters came in and they, and they started talking about the bio, you know, the, the biology of the birds, they all wanted to blame the predators. Well, oh, there's too many hawks. There's too many owls. There's too many foxes out there. We need to be killing them all. I've shot every owl I've ever seen my whole life. I used to hear all kinds of stories. Well, you think about it, and there is a predator out there, and it has the opportunity, an opportunist, to, to grab a quail. It's, it's awfully hard for them to catch a, an adult quail who's very well camouflaged and, and good at hiding under bushes and things like that. But occasionally a, a predator will catch one like a red fox, especially. And, and red-tailed hawks, not as much because they, you know, they they eat more uh, uh, mammals than they do birds. And barred owls hardly ever would would take a bob white, but um, they they were convinced that that's what the problem was. There's way too many predators out there, and the birds can't survive. What they were failed to note is that what the the birds that those predators were con help control were the nest predators, the 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 foxes, the red-tailed hawks, the, the barred owls, many of those, those predators that they were blaming were responsible for controlling the, the animals that got in, into the nest and killed you know a, a, a clutch of 12 baby bobwhites at one time versus picking off an adult every once in a while. So skunks are terrible predators on, on bobwhite nests. Rats and mice all the time getting into their nest. Uh, black rat snakes all the time. And what eats these animals? What eats these predators, these nest predators, but the ones that they claim to be killing every chance they had a chance to, to do that. So, uh, you know, predators are always an easy out for people blaming uh, the demise of any species. But in this case, it really, really is off base. Uh, and quite often when it comes to the predators making an impact, it has to do with what we do when we alter their habitat. So which, if you were a bird, a ground bird, which one of these habitats would you favor? Uh, modern uh, agriculture practices or native uh, uh, prairies. 
Now, and that, of course, this is more here in the Midwest, but also native grasslands out east. And I'm going to be talking about the pine savanna forest that I worked in for so long. But modern agriculture practices severely altered a lot of the landscape that these birds were surviving in. And in the early years of agriculture, when farmers went out and they disc a field and planted their, their, uh, their crops, they would leave head, hedgerows, edges around the, the field. And that some would even leave like 10% or 5% at the end of a field for wildlife. Um, those days are not that common anymore. Most people, most modern farm, because the, the farming uh, equipment is so good now, they disc from edge to edge and they hardly leave any habitat at all for the birds. Now, even if they do, here's a problem. When you concentrate all your good, decent habitat in strips like that along the edges of fields, who do you think hunts in those good strips? Yes, your bobwhites might be finding them easy travel ways and they actually get food and things there, but the predators that you complain about are concentrated into those alleyways and kill zones as well. So it helps the predators make a, make a bigger impact on them than they normally would by having their habitat spread out. So modern farming practices, yes, there's there's nothing for these bob whites out in these agriculture fields, hardly at all. And of course, chemicals are used there, et cetera. So loss of habitat is a major thing. Uh, and, and the habitat in, in, uh, where I grew up in, we had a lot of the pine savanna. So longleaf pines uh, and wire grass underneath. And this, the top picture is a beautiful example of what the habitat used to look like down there. And bob white thrived in this environment. And there, the, the wiregrass community underneath, uh, the pine grass, uh, the pine needles falling in there. Uh, and, and, and we're going to talk about fire here really quickly. So because this picture below there is a, a picture of the same hat type habitat, but where fire has been suppressed. In other words, they do not burn it. And so the understory is growing up into scrub oaks and the young trees and taking away the grass that was underneath that the, the Bob White needed so badly and the travel ways underneath there. So this is partial to blame for one of our favorite people or characters, and that is Smokey Bear. Um, wildfires are, 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 and controlled burns have now become so important. Where I grew up, the fires used to burn pretty regularly because of all the pine straw and that wire grass is very flammable and lightning strikes and, and especially in the middle of summer would, would cause fires and the fires would burn through the, the woods and, and of course they'd have to stop the fire. Obviously you don't want to burn people's houses, but the fire that it is introduced and burns in that community, burns off all the old pine straw, all the old dead grass, and all of a sudden that ground is opened up. And whenever I worked on the Bob White Quail Research Project I was working on out of college out down there, uh, we captured Bob Whites and we put radio transmitters on them and we let them go and we would follow them around with our telemetry equipment, the, the beep, 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 and we'd find them. And our, one of our jobs was to monitor habitat usage. And we got very used to coming in and uh, it, it would start the searching for them in the morning with our equipment. And one of the first things that I would ask is, where did they burn last night <laughs> or burn yesterday, burn the day before? And we were talking because they had to do control burns throughout the post uh, to maintain, to keep the fire danger down. Well, I can tell you, like the hunters would say, oh, you're burning up all the habitat. This what's happening. No. Whenever we, <laughs> those radio uh, telemetry birds, we would go to the area where the, the, the ground would still be smoking from the fire the day before. And the bobwhite would be out there in that charred habitat, picking up seeds that had been exposed to them by the fire that burned off all that grass and all that pine straw. So yeah, the, the, the fire was reinvigorating the habitat and causing new growth of, of that uh, wire grass, which produces all the seeds for them. And that seed can fall to the bare ground. The quail can lead their babies out there and they can find insects and find the seeds that are exposed on the ground after the fire has removed it. The same thing in the tall grass prairie here in the Midwest. The, the, the two things that kept the prairies under control and it can keep them from trees growing up in them and becoming forest were the bison, the large scale lawnmower, lawnmowers or wildfires. Now today, 
we use control burns to burn off the the rank grasses and, and expose it and, and cause that new green grass in the spring and the, the bison love it. They, they, and they graze it and they graze it in a patchwork. So there's patches that haven't been grazed and patches that have been grazed and this great habitat diversity for birds like Bob White quail and, and the Eastern meadowlarks, Western meadowlarks, bobolinks, all kind of grass on birds. But what was so much has happened is we have converted a lot of those grasslands to Here's my picture here, fescue. Now, here on the bottom is a fescue pasture, the, the fescue grass, and on top are native drop prairie drop seed grasses. And I, I got this picture because I wanted to show you how those prairie drop seed grasses, which are native prairie grasses, which have always been here, they grow in clumps. So there's a clump there and a clump there and a clump there, and there's open ground underneath. The, the grass may lean over, but the quail can run underneath and they'll take that grass and they'll bend it over and build their nest underneath one of those clumps or by one of those clumps is where they like to nest. And the babies can get out there and walk around when they hatch. Fescue, which has been introduced to way too much of the landscape, but it's a, it's an, a, a plant you can't kill. And there's tons of uh, problems with it, and I'm not going to go into all of that because uh, you know, it, 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 we're worried about why the, the birds have declined. Well, when you see that fescue, how it is tied up the ground, it is a solid carpet, and there is no way it, 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 any seeds that are there fall down in there and get to the ground. Well, the birds can't get to them, and whenever you are a mother quail and you've got your babies and you're running them around and you're getting, trying to take them to areas where they can have access to seeds on the ground and to bugs, they cannot survive in that fescue. So so thick and so matted, it just is not uh, accessible to them. Not to mention uh, in the spring when it's very, very wet, uh, the grass is solid wet. Well, the baby's getting wet that time of year is very dangerous. Have a cold night or two and you're losing your baby. So the, the combination of how tight it, it covers the ground, plus the moisture, um, and especially in the spring months when the, the babies need to be out there uh, growing, it, it's a double whammy against them. So um, that prairie drop seed grass with the clumps, those little babies can walk in between it. They can walk in all around those little clumps of grass and find seed on the ground from the forbs and things like that. So an absolute, when we talk about the, the stacked against uh, the the Bob Whites, that's another example on it. And the fescue, I, I'm going to pull up this one, it's called the fescue belt. Now in that dark shaded area, and, and you can look where you live, fescue dominates the, the grassland areas now because it, it uh, you know, for cattle grazing and things like that. And, and I, can, I, I can do a whole program on nothing about the problems with fescue to, to the cattle and everything else, but it's, you can't kill it. Uh, native prairie grasses that we described there, or we showed to you, they take extra work and, and it's a lot, a lot of farmers don't want to put that into it. And I understand that it's, it's very difficult, but in an ideal world, It'd be better for the birds. Uh, and that the, the, the idea of this program was to uh, talk about, you know, the, the reasons for their demise. Um, uh, and, and the last, of course, I'm going to throw out there are ice and, and snow and severe weather winters on them. Uh, again, you're talking about a ground nesting bird and it lives this, almost its entire life on the ground. And you have stretches of really harsh weather like this. And you can see why that would cause... Uh, Bob White, a great deal of problems because they're, they just can't deal with long drawn out uh, spells of this harsh weather. And so of course you guys that, that live on the north and west part of their range, that's where they're, they have more of this harsh weather, whereas the south, they don't have nearly as much, but this is a big factor in some of those ranges of, of the Bob White. So um, I, you know, I appreciate the, the request to do this, I, and like I said, Bob White are near and dear to my heart, having worked with them very closely for so long, and, and I, uh, it, it breaks my heart to see that their populations, and I know, believe me, our conservation groups are doing a tremendous amount of work trying to help them. Almost every state wildlife organization within that range of that map have special programs to help the Bob Whites, and you know, the Bob Whites forever, there's conservation groups, and 
uh, they've been pouring, pouring research and money into trying to help them. And they, in some cases, they get they, they get some results and the, and the numbers start to build back up. Um, but there's a lot of things going on and, and like things you can't change. Uh, but we're trying to keep them going. Uh, but and sadly, especially if you're even a fraction urban, you, you probably don't hear them anymore. You know, and, you know, in urban areas, I yeah, didn't throw in pictures of house cats. Uh, that's another major predator uh, on nest predator and, and predator on the adults in the urban areas. So they they pretty much disappeared from a lot of the urban areas across their range. So Northern Bob Whites, a great bird. Uh, thank you for the suggestion for that program. If you have any more ideas, send them in. Please, I want to talk about what you want me to talk about. Uh, please give us a like, give us a share. If you haven't subscribed yet on YouTube, please do that and ring that bell so you know when the, I'm going to be on next. I will send you notifications. Thanks so much. Next time, let's talk birds.